doesn't your preacher do good work? Look at this book. I mean, I got this, and I said, it looks a whole lot better than it did when I sent to him. Uh, the original, he just enhanced it. Boy, I put your table of contents in there and your order, your schedule for the seminar, and bound it up, and it just looks really good. Even the tabs, it'll help you to stay right on track. And talking about staying on track, I'm going to do my best to stay on track I've actually committed myself, you can see by the schedule, as to when the session's to start and when it's to end. I'm never too much worried about when they start. It's ending. That's my hope that I can make it all fit within the time. But I can tell you up front, we will not have too much time to what we say up in East Texas, Dilly Dally. You know, we're going to have to get to the chase and get right on it and pretty well stay on track. But I must tell everyone that there's more that I need to say that is in these notes. So you'll have a copy of the notes. Now, if you've looked at your notes already, you know that in there are blanks, blank spots. That is, you're going to need a pen or a pencil so that you can fill in the blanks. And I have attempted to keep the number of blanks short, a small number. And uh, you'll see them in the workbook as it comes your way. While I'm talking to you, I'm going to make a deliberate effort to tell you what would go in those blanks. I may not point it out every time, this is the answer to that blanks here and there, perhaps yes, but for the most part, I will simply give you the answer to the blank, or blanks, in some cases plural. But also, we have a PowerPoint that will be going along, and every one of these blanks is answered on the PowerPoint. So if you're listening and watching, you should have the answers to the blanks, and I don't want, though, to spend a whole lot of time saying blanks this and blanks that. You know, I just want to go ahead and teach, and uh, just do, do know, though, that all the answers will be there. I made it a point to not put any blanks in your handout that are not answered on the PowerPoint, so that way you would have every one of them. Well, we are going to talk about your Bible and the reliability of your Bible, you have one? We have Bibles in the house tonight. Just hold them up. I'd like to see how many we have in here. I'm not going to count. My goodness, I think we have more Bibles than we have people almost in here. That's a good thing. You know, there's one thing that a preacher never gets tired of, and that's used Bibles. <laughs> and I mean Bibles have really been used to, to search them and see what is in there. I want to start out by giving you the statement of purpose that I have here and why I'm here, why we're doing a seminar of this sort. Uh, I think it's going to become obvious as we move through here that this kind of teaching, this somewhat um, uh, in-depth teaching, it's going to get a little technical and be pretty uh, intense, is not easy. It's not easy to get it together. It's not easy for you to absorb it. And I think your mind's probably going to get on overload as we move through this week because the seminar is structured in that it sort of builds and a whole lot of aspects of how you got your Bible and how you can believe that it is really true, go into this picture. Now, my goal is to enable you to take an honest, informed look at the Bible you own. Right now, I'm not talking about which kind of Bible in the sense of whether you have a King, King James Bible or a NIV or a NASV or a jillion others, and there are lots of, lots of those. I'm just going to talk about the Bible itself. And I want you to take an honest look at the Bible you have. Whatever kind, I would guess in this room that most of you have a King James translation, just like I have right here. We're going to talk about uh, the merits of the King James translation as this thing goes along. However, whatever kind you have, I want you to take an honest, informed look at it. Now, talking about blanks, and it's just up front here, you notice that honest informed is right there on the screen. So those are your blank cover, I mean, the answers for those blanks. You'll have to watch as we move along like this. It's doubtful that you have a copy of Hebrew. Anybody in the house not have a Hebrew Bible with you? No. Anybody here have a Greek New Testament with you? No. Nobody in the house has a Greek or a Hebrew Bible. And I would so go so far as to guess tonight that if you did have a Hebrew or a Greek Bible, you couldn't read it. <laughs> you just look at it and you say, that looks like Greek. <laughs> Maybe that looks like a foreign language to me. And it would be, of course. It would be a different kind of language. Most likely, yours is an English copy. An English copy. And there are many English translations 
whole lots of English versions of the Bible, and they're not all alike. And I say that with good reason. Uh, there are lots of reasons why I can say they're not all alike. Uh, we will look at some of those reasons in the seminar, and you will be able to see why your version of the Bible does not agree, perhaps, with somebody else's version of the Bible. And therefore, we're going to look at the reasons, and hopefully you will see how important, or maybe unimportant, some of the reasons that you may have held or have are. That's what we're looking to do this week. Now, in this second dot here, this second bullet point, I want to say this with just as much gravity as I have the ability to say it. This is a search for truth. That's your answer. We're, I'm here to help you, and I've been on a search myself for truth. Not Certainly in this study, it's about the Bible and the version of the Bible that you have. But I tell you, I would like to think of my life as a life that is in a search for truth. I want to know what's right. I want to know what is really true, what will stand muster and stand inspection. My objective is to come as close as I possibly can to learning what God actually said when he gave his word to those who actually wrote the scriptures at the hand of God. And we're going to see tonight that they wrote them at the hand of God. Paul did, and Moses did, and Peter did, and David did, and a whole lot of others who were in there. They wrote these at the hand of God. And my hope is I would like to know what God said to John. I would like to know exactly what he said to John. As close as I can get it, I want to know the truth. I don't care what a version or translation says per se. I am interested in that. But I want to know that that translation communicates to me what God actually said. Not what I wanted it to say, not what I thought it ought to say, or not what somebody else thought it ought to say. I want to know what God said when he gave those actual scriptures. So I want to repeat this here. I do not want a copy of the scriptures which says what someone else says that it says. You have to think about that a minute. I do not want a copy of the scriptures that says what somebody else says God said. I want a copy of the scriptures that do not necessarily say what I want it to say. Every one of us has preconceived notions, and we'd like for it to be this way or that way. I'm telling you tonight, I'm not here or anywhere trying to tell you what I think it ought to say or what I wish it said. I want to tell you what it says, just what God says when he gave the book. I want a copy that includes what God said when he gave it no more and no less. That's the bottom line. Now, the subject is not as cut and dried as you might at first assume or might think that it is. You know, I'm, uh, I'm three score and ten plus a few years, and I have been in the Bible all my life. I had a fellow call me today from East Texas, and uh, he wanted to order a basic discipleship uh, teacher's manual from me, and uh, he said, told me where he lived. He lives in between Huntington, Texas, and Zavala. Uh, you may be up here, <laughs> that's just those are little bitty towns at the very bottom end of East Texas, or, or at least Angelina County in East Texas. And as I was talking to him, I mentioned Farm Road 1818 that goes from Hunt, uh, Diabol and comes into Highway 69, the Beaumont Highway, just out of uh, Zavala, a little north of Zavala. And he said, the church where I'm pastor, it's named Ozias Baptist Church, he said it is on 69, just a mile from that intersection there. And so we begin to actually talk uh, about uh, this matter. And so I told him, I said, if you got on 1818, went toward Diabol, about halfway down there, you'll come into a little community named Prairie Grove, and you'll pass the Prairie Grove Baptist Church. And I said, that's the first church I ever pastored in my life down there. I was 14 years old when I was pastor of prayer. Now I wasn't, I mean, they called me as pastor, but listen, they knew more about it than me. <laughs> they, they, did. they were desperate. And I, it was, anyway, I was pastor of that church down there. So I'm telling you that from back then, 14, 13, actually when I was saved, on forward till now, and I'm 74, I've, been, I've spent my life in this book. You know, I've read it through over 30 times. And I have studied it and studied it and studied it and studied it. 
But I have to admit to you that I never really got into serious consideration of how God got this book to me over that many years and kept it pure the whole trip. That is no small task. You talk about involving some dynamics. That involves some major dynamics for him to get this uh, book to us in some sort of factor because our semblance of, of believability because there are m numerous complex factors in the picture of originality, receiving God's word and then passing it on from generation to generation and from language to language uh, to other uh, generations in a pure form. It's just amazing to me <clears throat> that it didn't get lost in the process. I mean, if it hadn't been for the hand of God, it would have. Because uh, it had every opportunity to get lost. But it's a divine preservation of God, as we're going to see. So we're going to look at some of these factors. What are those factors? How did it get here? How did they manage to succeed with this job? God managed to succeed, really, with this job. Now, a second goal. I mentioned that the first goal of mine is to give you an honest, informed look at the Bible you own. And the second major goal that I have here is to cause you to trust and support the Bible that you own because you see it for yourself. I want you to see it for yourself, that it is a good, reliable translation. Since nobody here has a Greek or Hebrew Bible, you all have English Bibles, I want you to be able to look at your English Bible and believe that it is a good translation of the Word of God. Now, under that, I need to make a couple of comments. Too many people believe one translation over another translation because they trust the one who said this one is better than that one. That grieves me to say. That's not just true about Bible translations. It's true about doctrine. It's true about a lot of what we claim we believe and we do believe. But we don't believe it because we know the issues and we see them for ourselves as in this case, what got it here and why this one is better than that one, uh, we say it is the best because Brother Hudson says it's the best. Our Brother Neil says it's the best. Or some other person that we know and have great respect and regard for says this one is better than that one. It's an easy, common human thing for us to get on board with the people that we know. That violates, uh, there's a certain aspect of goodness to that, but that violates what I call the biblical Berean concept. The Bereans were, it was a town in, uh, uh, up around close to Philippi in Upper Macedonia, and the Bereans, uh, Acts 17 says, were more, no, more noble than the Thessalonians because they searched the word daily to see if what things were being taught were true. That ought to be all of us. We ought to believe things. We ought to trust people. Say, well, I assume that's true, but I'm going to check it out. Listen, any preacher, any teacher that minds or, or doesn't want you to check him or her out needs to be suspect. You need to put a real caution light up there. If they're giving you the truth, I will tell you, brothers and sisters, the truth will stand inspection. So look for yourself. Find out for yourself why you believe what you believe. Give reasons. Give an answer for the hope that lieth in you. This line of reasoning, that is, of believing things because somebody else said it, somebody you like and somebody you trust said it, is called ad hominem uh, arguments, and it is a common thing in our, our uh, world. It's based on personality and based on emotions and generally not a whole lot of fact, and it's a poor way to think. It's a poor way for us to be. And I've found out that some of the people who know the least are most passionate about it. You ever notice that? Boy, they'll argue the horns off a billy goat without anything substance to say. Well, sometimes it's, what is that old saying? It's better to be silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. I think we need to know where we stand and where we are. We are. Now, this seminar will not make an expert out of you. So I don't want you to think that it will or that I am one because I'm not. You know what they say about an expert, it's just a spurt under pressure. Well, I don't want you to go away thinking, well, boy, I heard this seminar by Brother Hudson, and boy, I'm going to go out here, and it's going to really be an expert in this area. Well, what I'm going to do, hopefully, and this seminar is going to do, is open your eyes and provide you with factual information which is um, sufficient to evaluate your stance. You can look at where you are. 
you can give you can check it with some some evidence, some facts that we're going to present here, and you're going to also, as you can see it, uh, just like here on the first page, there's a reference. I've got about sixty something of them in this little treatise here, and you can go to these reference books. These are not all the reference books, but they're some of the better ones, in my opinion. And by the way, in these reference books, I have tried to present reference books on both sides of the issue. Sad thing to me that most of us, when we come to a position on an issue, we turn all the other books and all the other input off, and we go to the books that support our position or the people that support our position. Well, it's good to fortify your position, but brother, let me tell you, teams, football teams, basketball teams, they don't really know where they are when they're in a the scrimmage. They find out who they are when they get up against the big boys that are opposing them, trying to take them down. You probably won't really know where you are in terms of strength of your belief until you get some opposition to it. You get tested on it. And it's wise for all of us to not just use all of our resource reading time, reading things that fortify us. It's a good thing to hear somebody on the other side argue and attack us and say, okay, let me see if they got anything to say or if uh, maybe they don't. But at least you know where you are. If, a, if a, a general is going to take an army into war, I'm going to tell you, he's going to send some intelligence people out there first to find out what the opposition has, their weapons, what their strategies are. We ought to be at least that smart, wouldn't you think? Whether it's the Bible we hold, whether it's the King James Bible, we ought to just read stuff that fortifies, well, I believe in the King James Bible. We ought to read some stuff that where some people say, I don't. I have an NIV. And here's why I have it, and here's why I like it. You'll be surprised what it'll do to your thinking. And it's a good thing to know where you stand and stand there, not just because somebody else stands there, but stand there because you've looked at the reasons and you can stand your own ground. That's the way it ought to be. Let's go now to God's task of getting his word to mankind and keeping it pure over the ages. And you're going to need your Bible tonight more maybe than in the rest of the seminar um, because we're going to exegete a passage. It's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We'll be there in just a moment. Most of the rest of this seminar is going to deal with some things that are not necessarily talked about in the Bible. They're about the Bible and how it came to us, but they're not Bible text per se. But tonight, we're in a Bible text, and it's talking about God's task of getting His Word to mankind and keeping it pure over the ages. Now, let's talk about how He actually revealed Himself to humanity. Now, you imagine that God has been around the whole trip. I mean, I don't know how to say that any right, really. I mean, he didn't start anywhere, and he's not going to end anywhere. He's eternal. So I mean by the whole, God's always been around. Long time before Genesis 1, before he created the heaven and the earth, and then Adam and Eve and all the people that are here. But at some point in the thinking of God, he created the heavens and the earth, and he did put Adam and Eve here. And from them came the human race. So we have um, common ancestries. Uh, in Adam and Eve, all of us do. And God is a spirit, and people can't see him with a natural eye, like I look at you, or you look at me. And you can't go to God and sit down and have a conversation with God, like we can have a conversation, or I can talk to you. So since God is out there, beyond our ability to get in his presence without being consumed, how then could God give us an understanding of who he is and how he thinks? That's a pretty challenging test for God to get his word, his thinking, his truth to us. And there are three ways that he has gone about doing that. Three, as you can see, revelations of himself. One of them is his natural world. That's the first revelation of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And Rome, uh, Re, uh, excuse me, Psalm chapter 19 talks about this heaven and the earth and how it is God's divine revelation. Listen to verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, 
and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. This is a poetic description of the universe, the natural world, particularly the earth, but even beyond the earth of the stars and the uh, planets, the moon and such, especially that this natural world shows the very hand of God, its system, its design, a whole lot of ways. It's not my purpose to talk about that as such, but what the Bible argues here is that you can see the natural world, leaves on trees, animals of various sorts, trees themselves, water, chemical compounds, all of these things you can observe. I mean, you can go to a laboratory. You can test uh, chemicals and see if water is actually made out of two hydrogen molecules with one oxygen molecule. You can check those things out, and the more you check, the more you see system everywhere in the whole natural world. You see design. It's the hand of God. So the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork, but God also revealed himself in his Son. I will have you look at John, that is uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, not the small Johns there at the back, but in the book of John, chapter 1, here's the Bible talking about the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and his coming. Listen to verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, notice that's capitalized, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Word, W-R-D, literally logos, capitalized the divine logos. That's the Greek word. Uh, Jesus Christ is the Word. You say, well, are you sure? Let's go on. Verse 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Can you miss that? No. Here's the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made flesh. The context of 1 John will tell you who the Word was. It's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the divine Word revealed in human flesh. That's the reason they named him Emmanuel, God with us, Matthew 1, verse 23. So Jesus Christ, God here in the human flesh on this earth. And by the way, while we're there, look at verse 18, John chapter 1, verse 18. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, hath declared him, revealed him. Jesus Christ was divinity, but veiled. We could not have seen him. The people there would have been destroyed to be in his presence had he not veiled his glory while he was here. But he was no less God because he had veiled his glory and they couldn't see him in that glorious description like you see in the book of the Revelation in chapter 1 where he was just shining and burning. I mean, he's just glorious. Jesus is the revelation of God. And you hear him, you hear him talk, you see him do the deeds that he did, the miracles and all those things. Every one of those is a testimony of who he was. He proved his power over the natural world when he calmed a storm. He proved his power over disease when he healed the leper. He proved his power over death when he raised Lazarus, and especially when he raised himself. I'm talking about God in flesh. In Christ, you saw who God is, a revelation of God. But he's gone back to heaven now. And the natural world is seen by everybody, people who don't believe in God and people who do, and they have opinions about it. If you're going to understand the natural world, and you're going to understand Jesus and who he really was, you have to have the third revelation, and that's the one I'm holding in my hand. It's called the Holy Bible. It's the written revelation, the written word of God. And second, our 1 Corinthians chapter 2 talks about this being the revelation of God in the 10th verse. And by the way, when you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, drive a little stake right there because we're coming back, and that's where we're going to park a little while tonight. Chapter 2 and verse 10, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Reveal them unto us. What is them? Well, you'll see it's in parentheses in uh, the uh, Bible you have. 
it's a King James Bible, it's in parentheses, which means it's not in the Greek. Them is not in the Greek language. It was not in the original text. So what does them refer to? Them refers back to the scriptures, what God gave us, the written word of God. That's how we know about how to interpret molecules and science. I assure you today, the scientific world would be in a whole lot better shape if it would list, listen to what God says about things and interpret things in the light of Scripture rather than interpreting things in the light of atheism. But that's what we have here. We have a book that tells us about Christ, who he was. It's called the Bible, the Holy Bible, the Scriptures. And we have this same book that tells us about the natural world and about a lot of other things, about sin and heaven and hell and about rearing children, about how to do your, treat your wife and your husband and how to work and what role it ought to play in your life. So we're just talking here about three revelations. How we know God. Well, God determined to show us the natural world. He determined to give his son. And then he determined to give us a book. And that's the book we're talking about in this seminar. And we're going to zero in on right now. So I would in the, invite you to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Where I ask you to put a marker there or a stake. And we're going to do an exegesis of this. Now, I don't want to get in too big a terms here. And I'm sure you've probably heard exegesis and Maybe you have it, but let me just tell you, it's simply a theological Greek term meaning that you bring out something. It's kind of like a, a revelation of bring it out. Um, our uh, similar word kind of like expository. I think I've mentioned to you before, uh, expository from the base word expose. So if I say I have in my pocket a knife and I bring it out here, see, I've just told you what was in my pocket and I've proven it by showing it to you. I've exposed it to you. Well, if I tell you something's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, then I'm going through it, and you have every right to expect me to show it to you. Here, that's exposing it or exegeting it. Exegete literally means to bring out of. That is, you go into the Scripture and you bring out the message of Scripture. There's an opposite word in the Greek. It's called eisegete, and eisegete means that you read into the Scripture. That's pretty common. A lot of preachers, a lot of teachers, a lot of churches, they have a preconceived notion about baptism. For example, Church of Christ, they believe you've got to get baptized and go to heaven. So with that preconceived notion, you have to get in water baptism to wash away your sins. They go into scriptures like John 3, 5, uh, talking about being uh, born of the Spirit. And they say that's being baptized of the Spirit. He is born of water. They say born of water means being baptized. Well, any woman that's had a baby knows the difference between a birth and a baptism. I mean, it's just a difference. I mean, a whole lot. But they, I mean, you see, when you've got a preconceived notion, and you've got to find something to prop it up, then you go into the Bible with your notion, and you say, well, say, yeah, this scripture right here proves what I'm just saying. Well, goodness, you know the old saying is, you can prove anything from the Bible, even if you ought to go and hang yourself, you ought to do it right away. The Bible says in one place that uh, Judas is carrot went out and hanged himself. It says in another place, do thou likewise, and in another place it says, and whatsoever thou doest, do quickly. Well, all three of those things are in the Bible. And if you put them all together, it says you ought to go hang yourself right away. Well, you can prove about anything if you are so predispositioned. But the way to get the truth from the Bible is to go into the Bible and exegete it. Go in and see what it says and bring it out. Don't take your notions in. Let it crush your notions if your notions are wrong. Anytime, on whatever you're on, any, any issue. So that's what we're going to do here with this book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 2. And I'll not read all the verses all at once, but I'm going to break them down, and we're going to just break them apart. And in verses 1 through 7, you're going to see that this is a passage about divine revelation and its confirmation. A passage about divine revelation and its confirmation. We're talking about how God got his thinking, his knowledge of himself and what he thinks about marriage, what he thinks about sex, what he thinks about children, what he thinks about work, what he thinks about... How did he get his ideas to us? Well, he revealed them in this written word of his. And this passage, especially 1 Corinthians chapter 2, though it's not generally thought of as such, is the, one of the best passages in your whole Bible that talks about this revelation process of how God got his word from him down here to us humans and then passed it on to all the different humans that are around this world. Verses 1 through 7, you see, number one, the wisdom of God involved and not of Paul or other humans. 
That's the claim. Remember, remember, the Apostle Paul was just that. He was an apostle. He was a specially chosen vessel from God through which God was going to give us at least a part of this book, these scriptures, which we now have together in a canon or a combined copy called the Holy Bible. Paul is an intricate tool of God in the process. And Paul's explaining that the information that he got, and he speaks for the other apostles and the prophets, he says this didn't come through human ideas. It didn't come through human notions. Look at verse 1. I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Let me stop right there for a moment. I think it would be hard to read these verses without seeing that Paul is saying that I didn't come to you because I'm a great orator. I didn't come to you because I'm a genius. I didn't come to you with my own ideas in this picture. I'm bringing to you there's a wisdom beyond me. He's going to explain later it's the wisdom of God. I'm telling you what God thinks on it. He has revealed these truths to me, and he's revealed these truths, some others, to other apostles and to holy prophets. This is what we're doing here. Notice that in your notes, there's a divine confirmation by the Holy Spirit. Paul said, I'm going to tell you something that's not mine. I didn't think it up on my own. It's of God. And I'm going to give you some proof. I'm going to do some things that are not human. I'm going to offer some evidence that confirms that what I'm saying is the word of God and not mine. Not just because I say these words are not mine, but the things that I do are humanly impossible. So therefore, I'm going to do these miracles to prove to you that I am indeed giving you the word of God. So then I will go back to that verse. For my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. <laughs> Just look at that. If, I, if I've ever heard a verse in the Bible that was beaten up out of context and misused, it's this verse right here. I've heard some preachers, because they can get passionate, like maybe sometimes I do and chase to us, you know, Hey, well, bless God, I come to you in the power of the Spirit tonight. Well, hello. I understand that when the, we're preaching, we ought to be preaching that God uses us, but we're not in the same power of the Spirit that Paul, Paul was. Let me tell you, he said, I came in demonstration of the Spirit. You say, well, what did he do? Well, one time, he was shipwrecked on the island of Crete, you know, in Acts 28. And when he got off, it was cold in wintertime, and they got some sticks together, they built a fire, and he uh, heated up a, a poisonous snake, a, a deadly snake, and it bit you, you'd die. Everybody on the island knew that. And the snake bit him in the hand. The Bible says he just shook the snake off in the fire and went on about his business and never swelled up. <laughs> and then they thought he was a god. <laughs> you know what they realized? Whatever it is with this guy, it's not human. He's got a message for us. It's not just an ordinary. It wasn't he just got real wet and uh, sweaty and passionate and spit to the third pew when he started preaching. That's what a lot of preachers think power and demonstration of the Spirit is, just getting all higher, hot and fired up about it, you know. Well, I like to see people got a little passion, a little life about them. But let me tell you something. Paul's saying, look, when I wrote this book to you, I didn't come just in my own strength. I came in the demonstration of the power of God, Holy Spirit and miracles. That he did by the power, obviously, of the Holy Spirit of God. And by the way, it's not just a snake story that's true. There's others where you'll see the Apostle Paul, and Peter did it too, and John did it too, and some of those other guys to whom God gave these abilities. They had miraculous working powers. And what was the purpose? Look at the next verse. You'll see it in verse 5. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's the purpose of the tongues. That's the purpose of the miracle healing. It wasn't so that a guy can get on TV and say, if you send me a $100, I'll send you a prayer cloth. And, and, and it wasn't a money-making deal. Never. 
Its purpose was not to aggrandize the person doing the miracles. The miracles' job was to prove the word that they were speaking was the word of God. Absolutely. And they did those miracles. So what the Apostle Paul is introducing in chapter 2 of this 1 Corinthians book is that he's talking about how God got his word down here to humans, how the God of heaven could communicate. He said, I've communicated to certain men who then got my word, God says, and gave it to you through special confirmation of miracles. Now I want you to look to the next section. We're exegeting through here. In this book, it's chapter uh, uh, 1, verses 8 and 9. And here's where you're going to find that not anyone could know the thinking of God apart from this divine revelation. Divine revelation. Let me read verses 8 and 9 in your hearing. Which none of the princes of this world knew. Well, could that be any clearer? You'd have never figured this out. Even the princes, even the smart guys, even the guys at A&M in Texas and Oklahoma, they'd have never figured it out if God hadn't explained it. They'd have never come up with the concepts of redemption, the, the person and work of Christ's sin and all of that, had it not been divinely revealed to them. Divine revelation. Paul's saying it. Look at it again. Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known them, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. You talk about hearing the Bible just butchered. I've preached to a good many funerals in my day, and I've heard a bunch of others. And I don't know how many preachers I've got heard get up, especially at the funeral time, and quote verse 9 or read verse 9 and say, you know, folks, we just never, it hadn't entered into the heart of man, and I had not seen what God has prepared. And there's the truth to that. I don't think any of us know what God has prepared for us in heaven. It's better than we can think, and I say amen to that. But this verse is not talking about that. This verse is talking about divine revelation. It's not talking about what God's got in heaven. It's saying that basically, as you'll see in your notes, it would have been impossible through natural methods. That's the word through natural methods to have ever come up with the great concepts and truths that we have in the Holy Bible. It was not going to be figured out by the smartest minds on earth in any age or any combination of men. Never through the scientific method. I think you know what the scientific method is. The scientific method is you examine evidence. You examine facts. You get into a laboratory. You get a Bunsen burner, you put something in the test tube, some water, and you boil it, and you catch the, the uh, vapor, and you check it out, and you see if it's water, or if it's made, if maybe it's a toluene, or it's some other, it's some other uh, chemical or combination. You test it. You have ways in science to, to look at it. You weigh it. You measure it. You, you look at it under various conditions, the scientific method. We draw conclusions based on our research of what we see. We dig in the ground. We get skeletons. We, hear, we get bones. And we draw conclusions from what we do. It's the scientific. Paul said, you'd have never got this thing about sin and the fall of man and the redemptive work of Christ and the hypostatic union, that is Jesus Christ, being God in flesh, in one body, the immaculate uh, uh, virgin birth of Jesus Christ. You'd never get this business about the second coming by going into a scientific laboratory and ever using the scientific method. You'd never come up with it. By the way, if you think you wouldn't, just look at what they're coming up with. <laughs> they're not even close to the truth. I mean, they think we came from a big bang. They think we, we crawled out on the land, out of the sea. Yeah, really. And somehow we got legs and we got to walking around and we eventually evolved here. I mean, that's... That's the kind of thinking people that leave God out of the equation come up with. And Paul said, this is not how we got this Bible. Not how this came about at all. It was not the scientific method, nor the general consensus method. You know, there are other areas, uh, especially in uh, psychology, some of those fields, where you get people together and you have summits and you let people talk to each other and they share, share each other's ideas and that sort of thing. And and sort of come to a general consensus of how it ought to be and what really is true and what really isn't true. 
Paul said, not that way. No, not even get it that way. It is written, I have not seen the scientific method, neither have the ear heard. We didn't just sit around and hear it together and you know get together like that. Nor have it have entered into the heart of man. That's the introspection we call it, or I call it method. The introspection method is where you, you do the Star Wars thing. Luke, look within yourself. You'll find truth. The force is with you. You know, we bought that. It's a popular series, isn't it? Yeah. People believe, yeah, look within yourself. And I'm hearing more and more of that in our day. Just look within it. Truth, you'll find truth. It's whatever you think about you. Whatever you want for you. That's the real truth. That's what you're after. No such thing as absolutes. It's just whatever's right for you. Do that. And here's Paul, the apostle, talking about divine revelation, saying this is not how we got the Bible. It didn't come by people looking in their hearts, people talking among themselves, or people getting into some scientific way and finding it. Well, how did it get here? Look at the next verse. It's 10. But God hath revealed them to us by His Spirit. This is divine revelation. Boy, this is the one they throw out at A&M and Texas, University of Houston, Baylor. Ah, no such thing as divine revelation. First of all, we don't believe there's a God. And if there's not a God, he couldn't have revealed anything to us. All information we have is accumulated information of the ages. Whatever man has, we've put it together. And by the way, we've come to a position now where we know there's not a God. That's what the, I'm not saying that. I'm just telling you that's what they say in the scientific world and much of it today in the very academic world today. Let's leave God out of the equation. We don't accept revelation. We don't believe the Bible. It's a book of mythology. It's just something what a bunch of Jews wrote back there a long time ago. It has no bearing on the real world. But Paul said this is how we got this book. This is how this came to be. God hath revealed it to us by his spirit. Search it, for the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God <laughs> knoweth no man. You hear that? You couldn't have known it without God gave it. No way you could have these truths here without God gave them. He, somebody did give them. And then verse 12, but we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. That's the apostle Paul saying about me as an apostle and the other apostles and the prophets, the things that couldn't be known by the scientific method through the introspection method or through general consensus method, those things that are out of their reach, God gave them to us through divine revelation. We have the spirit of Christ. We know the mind of God. He has told it. Not because we're smart, but because he told us what he wanted us to know. So, verses uh, 13, 10 through 13, and then verse 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, but uh, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. You hear that affirmation? The Apostle Paul said, we have the mind of Christ. He has chosen us to give his, his revelation, his written revelation through us to you. That's how you got it. So the answers for your uh, blanks there are divine revelation, as you can see on the screen. And then number two, through the apostles and prophets. How did he do it? Through the apostles and prophets. Well, let's move along. We must run. We must run. Making sure his revelation was kept pure and not lost over the centuries. That's the area now where we're going to move. Making sure his revelation was kept pure and not lost over the centuries. Though he gave his written word little by little, over almost 16 centuries, he gave it to mankind only one time. Only is your word there. He just gave his word once. Now, that's not saying he gave it all one day, all to the same person, but he gave it and revealed it, and when it was finished, he had it fully done, and he finished the job. What this is saying is God's not continuing to reveal his word. The Catholics have been arguing that he is for a long time. They call it progressive revelation. It's the idea that, yes, we believe the Scriptures, the Bible, the Holy Bible is true, but God speaks through his vicar, his pope, and that's new revelation. So therefore we have more. We have the catechism. Well, you've heard probably a lot of Pentecostal preachers and maybe some Baptists stand up and say, well, bless God, God told me this and God told me that. Well, if God told you to, why don't you write it in the back of your Bible? If God told it to you, God didn't lie. It'd be just as true as anything else you got in there. The reality is God finished his book of Revelation. He's not divinely revealing more Scripture. 
The world's still here, and the sun came, but the only written book of Revelation we have is a one-time job, and it is called the Holy Bible. That's the revelation of God. It is the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Jude verse 3. You hear that? Once delivered. Not many times, two or three times, once delivered. He never has given his revelation individually or privately to a whole, on a wholesale basis to each man directly in the individual's heart. To the contrary, he gave it to pre-selected men who wrote God's word and made them available to the rest of us. That's how I got it. I didn't get it because God just made me smarter than everybody else to figure out who he is and how he thinks or because that somehow he just appeared to me in a dream and told me or because he threw me a rock in the night with a note around it. I got it out of the Bible. Now, there were some men and teachers who taught me and helped me to see, but they weren't getting it out of themselves. They were just telling me what the Bible said. That's how we get it. That's how we know about God. We've got to get it through his revealed word. That's our only hope. That's how we interpret the natural world. That's how we know who Jesus Christ was. He wasn't just a great teacher, that he was God with us. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead, Acts 10, 41, going back where we were earlier. Here's one of these guys saying, he didn't reveal himself to everybody. He revealed himself to certain men, and we wrote it down, and we gave it to you all, and that's how you get it. And you're responsible to hear God, not because he told you in his heart, but because he revealed it to us, and we gave you a written record. That's the revelation of God. After God initially gave his word, there was the never-ending task then of preserving it. Now, how he got it from where he is down here to the human race. Now that it's in the human race, how is he going to keep it from getting lost from one generation to the next generation to the next generation? There's a big challenge, I assure you. Well, from the first, Satan don't like the idea. He doesn't like God. He doesn't like the Word of God, so he's been on attack against it. You see that in Genesis chapter 3. Here's the first man, the first lady that ever lived in the first three verses of Genesis 3, and here comes along Satan, and I'm just paraphrasing here, <laughs> I just tell you, he came to Eve and he said, yeah, as the Lord said, and then he begins to question God and, and say, well, that may not be altogether exactly the way it is because God knows that if you ate of that fruit that you would become wise, so he's withholding something from you. You really ought to eat that because God's not playing level and fair with you. And then... He just turned around toward the end of that section and said, God's lying about it. God didn't say that. And she bit it. She actually believed him and lied, I mean cheated to leave him over the Lord. Well, I bring that up to show you what Satan has been doing from the start. He's attacking the Word of God. And here's a copy of it. Now, don't misunderstand. When I hold this up and say, this is the Word of God, I don't want you to think this is all that God knows. God didn't tell us everything he knows. We're going to see that later in this seminar. But I'm telling you that he gave us here what he wanted us to know. This is true. This is true stuff here. All this book, it's a holy Bible, is a true book. And since it is indeed a true book of God, then the devil has been on the attack to somehow undermine it all along the trail. From Adam and Eve till now, he's one way or another been trying to say, eh, you can't really believe all God says. I mean, he, he's withholding something, or he's got all kinds of schemes. But this is a, ta a, a tactic of the devil. Now, in your note, you will notice these words, due to human frailties and error, the task of making error-free copies in one language for century after century was a major hurdle. And I, I put that just so you'd have to focus on <laughs> think about it. You imagine making copies, even if it didn't go into another language, just if you made a copy, if let's suppose the Bible had been written originally in English, and it wasn't even English, there was no English then. <laughs> well, let's just suppose it had been. And God had written the Bible in English. Can you imagine copying not translating, just copying copies from one generation to the next generation. Uh, it'd just be virtually impossible to keep some errors from getting in there. I mean, just 
Have you ever tried to copy yourself? I tell you, you try it. Write down, write down an original, or give your wife, get your wife to give you uh, five sentences to write. <laughs> if you're in a doghouse, and just go try to write them down five, ten times, fifteen times, and then go back and and proofread them. Listen, I've been writing books for years. And I read through those books. After I write them, I try to write them as carefully as I can, and then I go proofread them. And I say, did I write that? You know, I find so many mistakes, spelling errors, and words I left out, and didn't, you know, I put a the instead of the they. And I think, and then I read it again, and I find some more. And then I give it to Margaret, and she finds a bunch more. And then I give it to Phil Rice, friend, that helps me a lot, and he finds a bunch more. Sometimes I look at spell check. <laughs> Thank God for spell check. Man, oh man. Me, writing, reading, and editing my own stuff. I, I, I tell you, I, it's, proofreading has nearly ruined me. I can't hardly read a book now. Somebody else wrote. I get from Zondering or somewhere. I don't find mistakes, errors. In the, and here's somebody that's a real writer. I mean, a real hero up there. And I find mistakes. You think it was any different from those guys that got the first copies of the Bible? And that... Now we're going to we're going to write what Moses said down on a sheepskin and make sure it gets to the next generation and then Joshua's people are going to write some more copies and they're going to put them this this is a major just a major hurdle people are not capable of copying a lengthy piece of written material without introducing some errors and that uh, real scholar said that his name is DA Carson I mean, he's a Baptist and around today. But I'm telling you something, he's right. It's just impossible. Getting it into other languages and keeping it pure in many languages just escalates the challenge. It's one thing to copy it, just make a copy from English to English. But you start making a copy from English to Spanish and from Spanish to German. <laughs> it's not quite so cut and dried. It's not quite so easy as it might have at first you know, I'm this naive guy down here in Lufkin, Texas area, and 14 years old, pastor of church, and you think these thoughts ever occurred to me? How precious it was to have this book, and what a challenge it was to get to me. I didn't get to, I never thought about it. I think most people in most Baptist churches never thought about it. They'd fight the devil over their Bible, and have no clue as to how it got to them, and what a challenge it was to get to them. Well, it was a challenge, and it is a challenge. Well, God's Word is for the whole world. We ought to say amen to that, don't you think? It is for the whole world. It's not just for Americans in English. It's not just for English-speaking people. It's for German-speaking people and Japanese-speaking people and Afrikaans people and everybody else in the whole world. Not merely one people or not merely one language. That means that his word must be conveyed into all languages. We can't just have Hebrew copies and Greek copies and that's all and never translate them because we're changing a word from Hebrew to Greek, or from Greek to English, we've got to use similar words to put it in his other language, words that are as close to that one in the Greek as we can possibly get. We hope it's as close to convey that meaning as we can possibly get there, but we've got to get it into other languages because let's just suppose God had confined, confined his word to Hebrew and to Greek. Where would you be tonight? You'd be in dark, wouldn't you? You wouldn't know the truth. You wouldn't know how to be saved. You wouldn't even know you're a sinner. You just know your bad problems. <laughs> you wouldn't. You know where you stand because God got it to you in your language, so you could understand it in your language. Conveying His word from one language to others without corruption has been an overwhelming challenge, and I think that's probably the understatement of the night. It's getting it one language to another just an overwhelming challenge. Now, the Bible has been translated into many languages. Translated, that's your blank. Translated there. By 1991, there were 135 complete English translations, plus 99 abridged English Bibles. Additionally, there were 293 translations of the New Testament only. And you can see the source is given down here, D.A. Waite, in his book on uh, defending the King James Bible. So, I think... Uh, I think you can see, not to mention the Bibles in German and Syriac and Coptic and, and uh, Spanish 
and French and Japanese, not to mention any of those translations, just the English translations is phenomenal. I mean, large, large number of English translations of the Bible. Though there are numerous differences in these translations, both in choice of words and in doctrine. Now, I want to emphasize that two ways there are some differences in these English Bibles. Not, we're not talking about German Bibles or other. We're talking about English Bibles. In both wording and doctrine, each of them claims to be the Word of God. And most of them are viewed as inerrant and infallible and inspired. There's a whole lot of difference between this translation in English and what this one says in English and what that one says in English. In fact, and sometimes they contradict each other. And yet on both sides, they say, oh yeah, we got the Bible. We got... Can you imagine to some lost person coming into a church and hearing that kind of difference stated or read in a Sunday school class? Or, you know, he's, oh, here's a preacher up here preaching out of the King James Bible and he's got an NIV or some other Bible. And he sees that difference and he says, and they say it's both inspired. That, that's confusing, isn't it? I mean, that's got to undermine people's faith, and it does. In a typical church worship service, there will be many translations with major differences. And I don't think this church is typical of what's in a lot of different churches, but nevertheless, just it's very typical in many. For example, here are three simple examples, and I'm not going to in this seminar zero in on a lot of examples. I'm just going to tell you here and there one. In 1 Timothy 3.16, the King James Bible says God was manifest in the flesh. The uh, uh, New American Standard Version says he who was revealed in the flesh. And the NIV, New International Version, says he appeared in a body. Well, as I've just commented here at this uh, point, in the latter two, you see deity is really out of it. Now, I realize you might go into the context and realize it is talking about God, and therefore, but it sort of weakens the picture by using he instead of God. And that's very common. There's a little chipping. It's not a wholesale, in some cases, just beating up on, on the a good translation or what the real Hebrew or Greek meant. It's sometimes just a little weakening the words, taking out the deity of Christ and doing some of those things. That's a real uh, big uh, trend. The NS, uh, the uh, uh, New American Standard Bible and the NIV have footnotes that say some of the oldest and most reliable manuscripts omit uh, Mark 16, the last few verses there, 9 through 20. They say the, the oldest and better manuscripts, and we're going to talk about the older manuscripts. What are they? Where do they come from? How, how much better are they, supposedly, than, the, say, some other manuscripts? Well, they'll go back to those manuscripts and put a little footnote in your Bible and say, even though they don't leave out, most of those don't leave out Mark uh, 16, 9 through 20 or 21. They, they'll just say um, the better manuscripts leave it out. Kind of leaving you to think, well, God, here's something that really doesn't belong in your Bible. This is not good because the better one's no better. It shouldn't be in here. Did you see what that does to people's faith? It just undermines it. Yeah. Consider Luke 1, uh, 2 and verse 33. The KJV says Joseph and his mother. The NIV says the child's father and his mother. And the New American Standard uh, Version says his father and his mother. Well, you can see that uh, the virgin, the idea of the virgin birth is sort of out of that picture. And I understand you don't have to say it in every reference, you know, virgin born and so on. But I say this, when it's in the original text or source cops, source text, and you leave it out over here, there's something wrong with that. And we're going to talk about source text, and we're going to talk about... Uh, what it means to be go take to a target text later. It's not difficult, as I can point out here, to see how this, number one, creates enormous doubt and confusion and, and skepticism in people, and it undermines belief in the credibility and infallibility of the Bible. I mean, these kind of things do it. So, uh, I know you didn't think I'd get through on time, but I'm giving you 10 minutes back tonight, and uh, I'm glad to be able to get through here. I hope I have not confused you. I, as I have indicated, I've had to run along pretty rapidly, just in hopes that I would get through. But uh, I might take just a second or two, or not a second or two, maybe three or four minutes. If somebody has a specific question related to what we're talking about here tonight, I'll try not to get into the things we're going to cover later. But if you got a question and you just want to ask it, uh, I'll do my best to answer it. Anybody? Anybody?